name is Greg. Uh, as you heard, I'm a philosopher, so I'm entitled to, you know, say weird things. Um, and I will. Uh, one of my aim today is to, uh, to, sh to, to share, to, to show you in 20 seconds, in 20 seconds to show you the history and collapse of Roman Empire. I mean, of course, there will be some simplification involved, uh, as you might see, uh, but it still might be fun. You know, there's this kind of discipline of philosophy, which is called philosophy of history. It basically asks the question, what can we learn uh, from history for today? And it's a kind of tricky question, actually, because, you know, some people say, you know, history is just a set of dead data. You cannot basically learn anything uh, 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 from that, you know, some, some professors uh, I was cooperating with, at the beginning they, they asked me, Greg, but are you, are you a fortune teller? You, you basically want to learn something from, from history for the future? I mean, what, what's that? I mean, have, have this question in mind, what can we learn from history or, and, or can we learn uh, 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 for later? And to tell you uh, this story in, in, in 20 seconds, I, I basically need a, need, a, need a concept. The concept I have in mind is uh, it's, it's called complexity. Uh, very simple word, but basically the idea is that the things that evolve in our world, they move basically from simple to quite complex. And this regularity is to be seen in physics and biology and psychology and social sciences. Um, to give you this kind of intuitive grasp, uh, look at that picture. On the one hand, you have uh, you know a, a computer chip. On the other hand, you have a city district. They are qualitatively completely different entities, but still we can, when we look at that, we, we kind of feel there's, there's something structural, there's something similar uh, uh, about them. I will be dealing with uh, complexity in the social sciences. It's a very complex issue. You know, many definitions of complexity, different formulations, different explanatory capacity and so on. But for now, just throughout the next minute, have in mind, uh, stay alert to two words. I'll be pronouncing complexity and energy. Uh, look at hunter-gatherer society, nomads. You know, they walk from place to place, they feed on what they can find. Basically, their society is kind of, yeah, we, we cannot say it's complex, it's quite simple. I mean, few social roles, uh, not, many, not many people, they, they feed on what they can find. Uh, so if we can translate food for calories and calories for energy, we can say that as long as hunter-gatherers uh, rely on perishable food that they can find, they actually can't grow too complex. But what happens if they think of, okay, let's turn, let's switch to agriculture? Okay, they, they, they build farms, they, they, they need some new social rules for dealing with that, they need, to, they, they need lots of energy to, you know, to commit to building their farms, they need, they, you know, need new technologies. Um, but in return for doing that, they actually can cultivate vast amounts of lands, and as long as, again, as long as food translates into energy, they can, they, they can gain more energy. So they grow in complexity, they need energy for that, but in return they receive more energy. Um, for those who like definitions, complexity uh, in social science is often perceived as differentiation in structure, in number of parts, kind of parts, and organization. And of course, as I said, Complexity needs energy. This means energy is a capacity of doing work. You can actually f speak of energy, I mean, from food, from uh, uh, fuel, from electricity, and so on and so on. The important idea in that is that a surplus of energy means society develops. Uh, lack of energy, the society starts to run the risk of uh, collapsing. There's this American anthropologist called uh, Joseph Tainter who applied this concept to uh, the history of the uh, Roman Empire. And basically, look, what, I will, what I will show you right now is the territorial evolution of Roman Empire. Have in mind three things. That it's, first of all, it grows, of course, then it more or less stabilizes, and later on, it, uh, it shrinks. So it's like more, more like this, it's like uh, extraction, like st stability, uh, and collapse. And, and when you think of uh, Roman Empire as a system that grows in complexity, we can 
we can have this story. Imagine like the beginning of, of, uh, of Roman conquest, you know, roaming armies, great military power. They move throughout the continent, conquering new territories. From every territory they conquer, they, they gather wealth. And wealth is translatable to money. Money is translatable to work. Work is translatable to energy. So for every, every influx of, of uh, every new territory, they basically can gain more energy. So th this means they actually have a surplus of energy as long as they conquer. But think of what happens next. I mean, they grow in territory. And what happens? Like, you probably, uh, when you grow too much, you probably meet, meet some other people who are also big, right? So it, it actually means that Roman Empire met on its way different, different entities that started to compete for territory. Um, so in this way, it, it has to rely on agriculture. Uh, because it couldn't expand more, because expansion, further expansion was more costly. So we had to rely on agriculture, but agriculture, as we know, I mean, returns from agriculture are not that very stable. They, they are volatile, they change from year to year. And as we can see, after, after uh, Roman Empire stopped to conquer, it faced the lack of energy. And what can we do with that? Um, well, Imagine you want to do something about that, but in the meantime, there are uh, barbarians pushing your borders. So you need to, you know, you you need to greater defense of your of your uh, borders. So you need more complexity, uh, and you also need more energy. So what emperors did, they basically tried to overtax population to 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 to, to make this gap, this lack of of energy, smaller. Uh, but of course, it doesn't work when you overtax people. They become upset. They, you know, they become kind of alienated. They, they, they start to curse you. They say, you know, we don't, we don't need this, you know, this far, far, uh, far away power in, in Rome. And this is actually what happened in, in, in Roman Empire. The collapse. The collapse was actually an economizing process, which brought back the the European society to the, to the level where where the energy still was in the surplus. A collapse uh, is a substantial loss of, of a level of complexity. Uh, some qualities that decrease, like social hierarchy, centralization of power, uh, trade flow, and so on and so on. So Roman Empire in 20 seconds, as I, as I promised, it's like, it's the movement from, 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 from st stable energy to, to lacks of energy and to fundamental lack of energy, which is later on caused by collapse. So as soon as Roman Empire stopped conquering, it actually, it actually ultimately had to give way to medieval kingdoms that were less complex, but they had more energy to uh, cope with daily, daily uh, problems. Dramatic look, right? <laughs> um, okay, now, enough of Roman Empire. Now switch to European Union. Uh, we have European Union, like, like intuitively we can say, you know, European Union is also, you know, an evolving entity. I mean, it's a po social political system that, you know, that evolves, uh, you know, quantitative, uh, qualitative change in, in, from 1992, which is happening right now in Maastricht, uh, actually established it as a, as, a, as a great entity. So we actually can say it's also a social political system that right now is growing in complexity. But of course, like, you know, many things are different. But first of all, Roman Empire is not existing. European Union is just starting its, its own history. Uh, but there are also more fundamental differences, uh, uh, as you might notice. They both expand, but, you know, uh, first of all, there's, there's no war today. I mean, we, we're all, all very much into, like, soft power, lobbying. You know, diplomacy is, is made on the banquets. So I could, I could actually say that Machiavelli is, you know, not wearing a black tie, you know, is not wearing a uniform, at least in Europe. I mean, we actually switched to this force-based uh, politics, and it, yeah, that's great. Um, we can compare European Union and, and Roman Empire, uh, whereas European Union is based on trade, industry, services. Rome, when it didn't uh, conquer, it had to rely on agriculture. Uh, uh, European Union expands through cooperative diplomacy. I mean, the access to European Union is voluntary. I mean, 
in case of Roman Empire, I mean, no one actually, you know, not your daughter ask you, you know, if you want to join Roman Empire. I mean, you, if your armies were not, you know, not fitting to, to uh, they were not strong enough, you just, you know, you just perished or submitted. Um, so the, the, que the question I, I have to answer is like, what, what, what in 10 years? I mean, what, what, what might happen in 10 years to European Union? Basically, um, European Union is very unlikely to, to, to uh, gain new territories in the future. It's, it's one of the reasons for that is that it, uh, it cannot basically move eastbound, like to westbound is only sea, so you know, it has to move eastbound, but it probably won't, because uh, another big player in the region, Russia, is actually regaining um, its influences and it's in, in Belarus, in Ukraine. Uh, there's also another interesting country, Turkey. Uh, Turkey, as you can see from this color, light blue, is a candidate uh, for the accession to EU, but it's a candidate for very, very, very long already. And, you know, in 10 years, it's quite unlikely that it, that it will join uh, a EU, which means European Union will, will, throughout 10 years, will, you know, keep digest, di digesting its, uh, uh, you know, its current situation. It won't, it won't grow bigger, at least ter territorially. Um, collapse of European Union, of course, compared to uh, Roman Empire is, of course, unlikely. Now the world is full. We, it's all about, you know, network power, power blocks. And imagine what happened if, if an entity is very close to collapse. It is either supported by, by some external actor or it's absorbed by this external actor. Um, well, but EU is more kind of subtle. It's not the state. So, I mean, if cohesion of European Union could plummet, I mean, this might happen. We already have some demographical problems, religious tensions, some groups, social groups claim they are alienated. You know, if solidarity of European Union could fall apart, that would be not a, not a you know, good, 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 good message, like not a good news. Um, but to conclude, um, Europeans already learned from history and created a created a peaceful, uh, expanding political entity. It's unlikely to collapse in the close future. It's evolutionary, it's gradual, and it's steadily growing, which actually uh, means things are more or less okay compared to the you know, social political systems from the past. Uh, let me leave you with uh, some idea by Immanuel Kant, a great German philosopher. In his in his essay towards perpetual peace, he wrote things like that. No state shall be acquired by another state. Standing armies shall gradually be abolished entirely. No state shall forcibly interfere in the constitution of another state. And also, the law of nations shall be founded on the federation of free states. Well, this is kind of what European Union, in, in certain respects, tries to be. Mind you, he wrote that essay in 1795, a year which was very tragic for my homeland, Poland. Uh, it was when the partition of Poland took place. It basically meant that three European powers, uh, uh, Germany, Russia, and Austria, they, they, they basically partitioned the country among themselves, leaving my nation uh, without a state for more than 120 years. But now, now, now things are different. I mean, we, 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 can, we, are, we are living all together. Uh, I can, you know, I can be with you. We can talk, you know, we can talk and deliberate, you know, about history, philosophy, and all of these weird things. So it actually seems to me that we learned something from history. Uh, what did we learn? First of all, that peace actually pays off. And, you know, more optimistic message is that what we do is, is, is only dependent on our will and that, that basically future is in our hands. Thank you.